right, it's the magic hour. I apologize for missing class on Monday. No, I'm not feeling better. I, I got this wretched cold. It will pass. I got from my wife, yes, that's true. It wasn't deliberate. She's a very nice person. But I tell you, my, I mean, I'm just so congested. It drives me crazy. Um, I brought my own box of tissues. Because yeah. remember this. When you're dancing with your honey and her nose is very runny and you think it's very funny, well, it's not. <laughs> Wait, tell your snail jokes. I'm not telling my snail jokes today. I don't have the energy to tell a snail joke. I'll tell the snail joke at some point. Really. All right. Um, what questions do you have for me today before I start? Finish off the Spanish American War and zip up to World War One. Carrie. Yeah, um, you know, I, I'll be perfectly frank. I don't, I don't agree with Doyle on his view of liberal pacifism. Uh, he's making the argument, and this was an argument that was made by a lot of people around the turn of the century, that capitalism was becoming so productive and was becoming so penetrating, uh, connecting all sorts of societies, that it became irrational to go to war that the costs of war were greater than the costs of not going to war. Um, and a very famous uh, a British historian by the name of Normal, Norman Angell wrote in 1916, uh, not 1916, 1913, he wrote a book called The Great Illusion in which he argued that war would never again occur. This is in 1913. Because people had figured out that trading and interacting with each other economically was a better way to conduct their business. And there was this real belief, and it's an enlightenment belief, that progress, you know, when you liberate the right reason of individuals, progress will lead us to make decisions that are almost inherently pacifistic. But Schumpeter also made the argument that uh, capitalist societies develop what, what he called warrior classes, uh, which then ultimately become the cause of imperialism. Uh, so I think that Doyle's use of Schumpeter was a little too eclectic, shall we say. He doesn't give Schumpeter the entire range of Schumpeter's views. And I don't even buy the liberal pacifism argument. I mean, I, I just don't think it's true. When Germany and France go to war in 1914, they each account for 30% of the other's GMP. They are incredibly interconnected. And one would, say, one would think, these countries won't go to war they're gonna to sacrifice too much of their economy by going to war. Well, nationalism overrides the economic, the, the sense of economic benefit. So, I wouldn't put too much in liberal pacifism. Yeah. I also have a question about the Doyle piece, um, especially Kant's views on international affairs. For Kant, is it essential for republics to go to war against non-republics? Well, no, no. Kant doesn't really talk about uh, whether or not Republican governments will go to war against other Republican governments. I mean, he does. He, he, does, he does talk about that. They won't go to war. No, no, but he doesn't talk about whether they'll go to war with non-Republican governments. The truth of the matter is, is that authoritarian governments go to war with each other all the time. Authoritarian governments go to war with democratic governments. <laughs> 
and democratic governments go to war with authoritarian governments. There is the historical paucity of democratic states going to war with democratic states. We don't have many of those examples. Um, and the question is, well, does that mean that democracy ingrains a respect for peaceful resolution of conflicts in a society so deeply that going to war becomes almost inconceivable with another democratic state? I mean, it is hard to imagine going to war with Canada. You know, it, it just is, unless they beat us in ice hockey. <laughs> then all bets are off. Um, or going to war with Britain. And you've got to ask yourself the question, why? Why is it inconceivable to see our, the United States go to war with those two countries? Because um, it shouldn't be. And indeed, when we get to World War I, there were a lot of Americans who thought that we should have gone to war against Great Britain on the side of Germany. And if you look at it from a purely self-interested point of view, a purely realist point of view, that's precisely what the United States should have done. Germany and the United States had exactly the same interest. The British Empire was choking off free trade because it was restricting trade within the colonies of the British Empire. And the Germans wanted to get into that, and the Americans wanted to get into that. So the Germans and the Americans should have joined forces, knocked off the British Empire, divided up the British colonies, and then at some point, Germany and the United States would have gone to war with each other. But that's fine. It would have taken a few decades before things had solidified to the point where we had to go to war with them. And Robert Lansing, the Under Secretary of State, under Woodrow Wilson, actually proposed that the United States go to war against Great Britain on the side of Germany. But his voice was alone. And Wilson, of course, would have nothing to do with it. He was a real Anglophile. He loved Great Britain. Exactly what Washington, in his farewell address, told us we should not do. We should not love any country. We should not hate any country. Permanent attachments are dumb in world politics. You attach yourself to the country that can benefit you at this particular point in time. That's it. Yeah. Oh boy, I can't hear. I can't hear a word you're saying. That's because my ears are all plugged up. Well, economic liberalization makes it easier to deal with the issue of resource allocation. And one of the, the key reasons why nations fight with each other is competition for resources. And so if what you do is you've opened up your trading to other countries without restrictions, such as tariffs or quotas, uh, you have pretty much allowed the flow of the resources that you need to be traded at the cheapest price possible. You don't restrain it for national purposes. And so the argument is that as you liberalize your economy, and liberalize means open it up to the principles of free trade, then there'll be fewer reasons to go to war. This is one of the reasons why so many governments try to work toward trade agreements. And this is the North American Free Trade Organization. Uh, this is the new transatlantic trade 
program that Obama is talking about, the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement that Obama is talking about. The whole idea is to reduce friction in trade so that competition for resources disappears, essentially. Everyone is in the same boat in terms of access to resources and has to compete for those resources on the sole issue of price, um, which is deemed to be fair. When you have national intrusion into the sale of products, um, and one example of this is when the Chinese decided that they were going to put restraints on the sale of rare earth minerals um, to punish the Japanese, um, that was putting a national restraint on the free flow of a very vital resource. Rare earth minerals are an essential component to those things that you have in your laps, your laptops, your phones, everything. The Chinese assertion of their right to put these controls on the trade of rare earth minerals made that very problematic and heightened the chance of war. Fortunately, the Japanese didn't go to war. But it certainly slowed down the Japanese economy a great deal. Does that answer your question? Just stop. What's the question? Uh, in the, does it mean that in the case of Chinese independence, if they, uh, they remain, uh, they have no restriction on any products, uh, does this mean that they have the political bonds of liberal rights and interests? Yes, if they have no restrictions, that means they have liberalized to the highest degree possible. Uh, but they haven't. I mean, the Chinese have a lot of constraints on what they trade, as do the Japanese, as do the Americans. Yeah, so this is one of the strategies of foreign policy, right? One of the strategies of? Chinese foreign policy. Chinese foreign policy, that is true. And it is not an unusual strategy of rising powers. In the 19th century, the United States and Germany were both highly protectionist, in the same way that China is highly protectionist right now. As you're rising in power, you want to protect what we call your infant industries, the industries that need to grow in order to make your economy dynamic. And so you put these restrictions in to allow the new industries to take root in your economy. Once they become sufficiently mature, then you drop the restrictions. So the strong yeah, so with understanding liberal internationalism, it means the free trade between different countries and small class nationalism, it means to put the nation's interest in the first place. That's right. And we actually call putting the national interest at the forefront, you know, mercantilism or protectionism. Uh, and the polar opposite to that is free trade. 
what's Chinese reluctance but behind referring the North Korean case to the ICC? Uh, the UN report accuses the Chinese of sending back defectors from North Korea back to North Korea. That is illegal. When people request political asylum under international law, and they show a reasonable chance that they're going to be prosecuted for political, not criminal reasons, nations have got to grant asylum. The Chinese never do. If someone defects from North Korea and requests asylum in China, the Chinese send them back immediately to North Korea. That means that China is complicit in the crimes against humanity because those defectors are usually killed. What will happen? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure anything can happen. I mean, North Korea is an incredibly isolated country, and very few countries have any contact with it whatsoever. Um, this is more or less an attempt by the United Nations to say, we've done our due diligence. And we should refer the matter to the International Criminal Court. The UN knows it's not going to be referred to the Criminal Court. And so they're going to put it on the shelf, and that's going to be the end of it. But at least we have a record for the future about the crimes of the North Korean state, for what that's worth. Now, under the current regime, North Korea is not going to open up its borders. It's not going to liberalize. The uh, regime relies too heavily upon the military and the tight control of its people. Um, well, North Korea is a very, very powerful military, but the military is well treated in comparison to the North Korean citizenry. You join the North Korean military and you'll get three meals a day and you'll get well, you're well taken care of. Whereas the North Korean citizenry is basically living on the brink of starvation all the time. And so the military supports the regime because they want to keep their privileges. All right, let's go back to the Spanish-American War. I made the argument last time that we were really talking about two wars. One that was planned, and that was the war against the Spanish in the Philippines, and one that was unplanned, that was the war against uh, the Spanish in Cuba. Both wars go well for the United States. The war in the Philippines is over in a matter of days. Um, Admiral Dewey, as I said last time, smashes the Spanish fleet in Manila Harbor. It wasn't even a contest. And the United States achieves control over the Philippines. It takes a little longer. Um, the first American troops land in Cuba in June, uh, June 25th of 1898. Um, and then uh, the, the, the decisive battle uh, at Santiago uh, occurs in July of 1898. And then there's the Treaty of Paris in December of 1898, which ends the war between the United States and the Spanish Empire. Unfortunately, the United States takes the Philippines as a colony. This is the first formal colony uh, that the United States has uh, in its history. Uh, it becomes a normal European state. 
with the taking of the Philippines. Um, it takes over, it takes control over Guam, Puerto Rico, Midway Islands, as territories. And then, the US imposes the Platt Amendment on Cuba. Now, the Platt Amendment gives the US control over Cuban foreign policy. In other words, if Cuba wants to make an agreement with another country, it's got to go through the United States. But the United States does not take over any domestic control over Cuba. In other words, there's no uh, establishment of a US government facility in Cuba. The only military facility that's created in Cuba is the military base in Guantanamo, uh, which exists to this day. And uh, the United States signed a 99-year lease uh, for Guantanamo, uh, the military base. That lease was up uh, in 2001. Uh, the Cubans requested that the United States leave. Uh, the United States said, no, we're not going to leave. And the Cubans haven't done anything uh, to kick the Americans out. Um, and so it's sort of uh, a very, very bizarre situation here. Um, it's not clear that the Cubans even want the Americans to leave. Uh, but Guantanamo is obviously a stain on Cuban sovereignty. Now, the interesting thing about this is that these territories, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Midway Islands, the word territory is the same thing, uh, same term that the United States used for the lands that it seized in North America. In other words, you had the Oregon Territories or the California Territories. And the distinctive feature of American imperialism in North America is that as it seized control of land, it offered the people who lived in those territories full equality under the US Constitution. In other words, the territories were not to be regarded as colonies. They were not fledgling states, if you will. They were, once they reached a certain size of, uh, or density of population, to become full-fledged members of the United States, which meant that when California becomes a state, it gets two senators, and it gets the number of Congress people proportionate to its population. The same is true of Oregon. Same is true of Washington. Same is true of Utah. The same is true of Arizona. The same is true of New Mexico. All these states were ultimately assimilated under conditions of complete equality. Guam, Midway, and Puerto Rico have not moved beyond the territory status. There have been referenda in Puerto Rico. There have been four referendum in Puerto Rico asking the Puerto Rican people, what do you want to do? Do you want to remain as a territory? Do you wish to become independent? Or do you wish to become a state in the United States? In all four of the referenda, the vote has been, we wish to maintain 
our status as a territory. Now, this is unusual, very unusual. One would think that the people of Puerto Rico would ask for full-fledged membership as states. It could be the case that you could make the same argument about Guam and Midway Island, except that I don't think they're ever going to achieve the level of population necessary to become a full-fledged state. Um, you're talking about very, very small territories. And so ultimately, the United States has got to decide what it's going to do with those two bits of, of, of territory. But Puerto Rico is an ambiguous case. The really difficult case is, of course, the Philippines. Colony is different. The United States did not say to the Filipinos, ultimately, you can become a state in the United States. Did not give them the status of a territory. It gave them the status of a colony. In other words, the Americans became the Spanish in the Philippines. You know, say hello to the new boss, same as the old boss. And almost immediately after the Americans declare the Philippines as a colony, an insurrection begins against American control. Um, it begins in uh, February 4th, 1899, led by a fellow by the name of Aguinaldo. And this turns into an incredibly bloody, bloody colonial conflict for the Americans. There are two phases of it. Um, it goes from 1899 to 1902 in the northern part of the Philippines, which is primarily Catholic. And ultimately in 1902, uh, the Christian Filipino population submits to U.S. rule. The insurrection ends. However, the southern part of the Philippines is Muslim. And they did not submit. And they continued the insurrection until 1905. And it's the U.S. fighting against the Muslim population, which are known as the Moro, That is unbelievably bloody. Um, and hundreds of thousands of people die. Interestingly, this cleavage between the Christian North in the Philippines and the Muslim South in the Philippines continues to this day. For those of you who have been reading my blog, you know that the Filipinos have recently granted a high degree of autonomy to the southern part of the Philippines in order to diffuse the tension between the north and the south, the southern parts of the, Filipino, uh, of the Philippines. Let's hope that that works. Um, but this tension uh, is long-standing. And the first anti, um, the first guerrilla war that the Americans fight is in Asia against Muslims, primarily. Tammy? The Christians in the Philippines definitely outnumber the Muslims. But understand, you know, when you're talking about the Philippines, when you talk about population, you're really talking about the population of which island? Okay, I mean, because the Philippines is an archipelago. And so even though most of the population is Christian, that's not true of each separate island. Ultimately, the, uh, there's a huge movement in the United States called the Anti-Imperial Movement, led by Mark Twain, um, that condemns the U.S. adventure as a colonial power, 
tries to force the United States to give up the colony of the Philippines. And in 1933, the Americans give the Filipinos their independence, and they become an independent state. Um, but it's a long slog. Um, and it's something that fits very uh, poorly into the overall framework of American foreign policy. Um, it's an aberration in many respects, an aberration started by uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, which ultimately uh, has an incredible backlash to the United States, which continues to this day. Although the Filipinos, Filipinos are strong, reliable US allies in the region. Um, and so, I mean, there have been some good things that, that have been able to survive the bad, the bad blood. Okay, that's how the Spanish-American War ends. Cuba remains nominally independent except for the stupid Platt Amendment. Can't make treaties with other countries without the approval of the United States, but the United States really doesn't prohibit it from making treaties with other countries until Fidel Castro becomes the leader of Cuba on January 1st, 1959. And at which point the United States becomes very suspicious of Castro's overtures to the Soviet Union. Uh, and then the whole thing becomes wrapped up in the Cold War. But that's getting way ahead of us. For most of the first half of the 20th century, uh, the United States really doesn't intrude upon the foreign policy of Cuba. Um, the Cubans uh, are, are, are unable to prevent U.S. corporations from coming in. Uh, United Sugar uh, becomes a very powerful force. Most of the petroleum refineries are owned by American oil companies in Cuba. Uh, the U.S. presence in Cuba is, from an economic point of view, overwhelming. And then those of you who've seen The Godfather know that the U.S. Mafia moves into Cuba big time under the leadership of Batista, who was a dictator in Cuba, who was buddy-buddy to um, the Mafia. And they set up casinos, and it became a real pleasure ground for American mobsters. I mean, this was very interesting scene in The Godfather where Batista shows everyone the uh, gold telephone that uh, ATT has made for him. And that's because he gave exclusive control of the telephone industry to ATT. Cheap. Make a gold telephone, you wrap up the telephones of all the people in the, in the island. Just like IT, ATT wraps up all those, all of you who want iPhones or whatever. They're still doing that. Have you gotten a gold telephone from ATT? No, but I got a 99 cent telephone. You got a 99 cent telephone? Mm -hmm. For signing a two-year contract. <laughs> For signing a two-year contract. <laughs> Great. OK, any questions about? the Spanish-American War. Very quickly, the United States reverts back to um, isolationism. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt doesn't have that much of an impact upon American foreign policy. It's, it would have been interesting if he had had more of an effect upon American foreign policy. I mean, he builds up the U.S. Navy to make the Navy a formidable force in world affairs, but he really can't stand up against uh, the politicians in the United States who read the American people as saying, we really don't want to have much to do with the rest of the world. And when, in 1912, the American people elect Woodrow Wilson president, uh, they elect a president who is pretty much a dyed-in-the-wool isolationist. Um, he does not want uh, the United States to get involved in world affairs. 
And when the World War I breaks out in 1914, Wilson has to run for re-election in 1916. He runs on the campaign promise of keeping the United States out of the European war. That's his firm promise to the American people, that the United States is not going to get involved in the European war. Now, you've all taken world politics, so you have a pretty good idea of what the internal dynamics in Europe are for World War I. It is the expansion of Germany uh, that is not welcomed by uh, France or uh, by Great Britain. They try to restrain the growth of Germany, and ultimately Kaiser Wilhelm believes that the only way out of this noose that France, Germ uh, Britain, and the, the Russians have placed around Germany is to go to war. And it's a very straightforward balance of power war as far as the beginning of the war is concerned. I mean, there's nothing really unusual about this war. Um, but it surprises everyone by the way it blows up. And it blows up primarily because of the new technologies uh, involved in war fighting. Those new technologies have been developed during the American Civil War. The new technologies are the Gatling gun, which is the machine gun, ironclad vessels, the Monitor and the Merrimack, and the submarine, which is developed by the United States during uh, the Civil War. Uh, and these are all new innovations that fundamentally change the nature of war. And the, the big, big change is the replacement of the cavalry with trucks and ultimately with tanks. It is this industrial war that the world experiences in August of 1914 for which the world is completely unprepared. And it turns into a slaughterhouse. Um, they're fighting, the Europeans are fighting the war using the battle strategies of the 19th century, but using the military equipment of the 20th century. Uh, and there's a complete and utter mismatch. Now, the United States doesn't want to get involved in this war, but the British and the French don't want to lose the war, neither do, neither do the Germans. And they spend an incredible amount of money fueling the industrial aspects of this war. It's not like the 19th, century's war, 19th century wars where you could just you know, conscript a whole bunch of soldiers and let them get killed. I mean, that was the strategy that Napoleon used. And ultimately, it was an effective strategy, except in Russia. In World War I, you had to build these things called howitzers, artillery, ships. The dreadnoughts were incredibly expensive. You had to get factories to produce the machine guns. I mean, you had to do all this stuff. You needed an incredible amount of money. It wasn't like saying, go out and have a lot of babies so that we can send your sons to war. You had to make stuff now. And the cost of war just skyrocketed. This shifted, ultimately, the balance of power in world politics. Uh, the, uh, the British are by far the preeminent financial uh, superpower of the world in 1914. By 1918, it's the United States. And it's this shift in the power of the United States that ultimately begins to shake the American perception of what the stakes in the war are. Wilson runs on this campaign promise uh, to keep the Americans out of World War I. But there are two things, two events, that change his calculation tremendously. The first is the sinking of the Lusitania in May of 1915, 
And the second is the Zimmerman telegram. in January of 1917. Now, the seeking of the Lusitania uh, was an unbelievably tragic event, but one that should have been anticipated. Uh, the Americans had started sending materials and supplies to the British on passenger vessels. This is in, in direct contravention of the rules of war. Um, you, you're not allowed to put military supplies on passenger ves vessels. They're supposed to be completely neutral. The Germans were well aware of what the, uh, the Americans were doing. Um, and this was an attempt by the Americans and the British to circumvent the ace in the hole that the, the Germans had with their U-2 boats, their submarines. Because the submarines were re wreaking havoc upon the shipping lanes of the North Atlantic. Um, the submarines were unbelievably effective. I mean, one of the interesting things about World War I is that the British and the Germans spent literally billions and billions and billions of dollars on these surface vessels called dreadnoughts the largest battleships ever built in human history. I mean, they were just huge. And they only fought one battle with their dreadnoughts. That was the Battle of Jutland in 1916. And as soon as that battle was over, both the Germans and the British brought their dreadnoughts back to port and kept them there. Why? Because they were too expensive to use as fighting vessels. You didn't want them to get sunk. And the Battle of Jutland was the only time these dreadnoughts were used. Now, submarines, on the other hand, were really, really cheap. But they were the things that turned the tide uh, in favor of Germany. Germany was able to do what the British wanted to do to Germany. The, German, the British plan in, against Germany was to starve them to death by having a, an embargo against food and other materials coming into Great Britain. And the British always assumed that they could get their supplies from the United States. And as long as they could bottle the Germans up in the North Sea, that would work. But the submarines were able to get out of the North Sea and get out into the North Atlantic. And they were devastating. They destroyed so much of the shipping between the United States and Great Britain that Britain faced the prospect of running short of vital supplies during World War I. So get around this. The United States decides it's going to start sending materials on passenger vessels cruise ships. The Lusitania was a cruise ship. Now the Germans went to New York Harbor and oh yeah, they put up signs, big posters telling everyone, don't sail on the Lusitania. The Lusitania is being used to ship military supplies. We are going to sink the Lusitania. They were very straightforward about it. I mean, the Germans were really sensitive to this. I mean, because you know, shooting, uh, sinking uh, passenger vessels is a criminal act, guaranteed to turn world opinion against you. And so the Germans put up these posters in New York Harbor telling the American people, don't sail on the Lusitania. Well, the Americans did anyway and the Lusitania was sunk. And after it was sunk, I mean, it was very clear that the Lusitania was carrying military stuff. There were, I mean, there were a whole host of Canadian uh, soldiers who washed up on the shores of Ireland in their uniforms from the sinking of the Lusitania. They were being transported on the Lusitania. 
Well, the outrage against the Germans was huge because they sunk the Lusitania. And the Germans kept saying, but we told everyone we were going to do this. And everyone said, doesn't matter. You can't sink a passenger vessel. OK. So the Germans announced, OK, we're not going to do this anymore. We'll allow passenger vessels to go, even though the Germans knew that you know, this was going to be a way for Britain to get resupplied. But they, the public relations damage was so great that they had no choice. Then, in January of 1917, the British intercept a telegram sent by the German ambassador to Mexico, to Mexico, telling the Mexicans that if you join us in fighting uh, and you attack the Americans, then we will help you regain the territories that the Americans stole from you in 1846. Now, the British intercepted this telegram. And no one really knows if it was true, if it was, if it was a real telegram. There were a lot of suspicions that this was a forged telegram that the British had made this all up in an attempt to get the Americans so angry that the Americans would then enter the war in 1917. Understand, the war had been going on from 1914 to 1917. And the British and the French were losing. 1917, they suffered a real disaster, which was uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, where the Soviets, the Soviet Union was created, and the Soviets decide to pull out of World War II, uh, World War I. And the Soviets basically say, we don't care what happens, we're pulling out. And that allowed the Germans to focus all their troops on the Western Front. They didn't have to fight any of the Russians on the Eastern Front. And in the early part of 1917, the Germans thought they were going to win the war. And they came this close to winning the war. But the intervention of the United States made all the difference in the world. Because the United States, when it entered, brought a whole bunch of new forces and new supplies to the war. Uh, and the Germans realized that they were weak, they had bet that they could outlast the French and the British, and they probably could have, but they were not going to be able to outlast this new entrant into the war, the United States. Even though the United States hadn't proven itself in battle, the Germans had no idea whether the Americans would be any good in fighting. Uh, the Americans really hadn't proven themselves in any war up to this point. The Germans, of course, have proven themselves over and over and over again through a variety of wars. So the Germans begin to sweat it. They realize that things are going badly for them. Now, the alliance in the West between the United States, France, and Great Britain was not a comfortable alliance. Wilson was a strange bird. He was not a realist by any stretch of the imagination. Clemenceau, the French minister, and Lloyd George, the British prime minister, were realists par excellence, complete realists. And as far as they were concerned, they were going to fight this war basically to solve the German problem. Wilson didn't want to have anything to do with this. So Wilson, on his own, without consulting Lloyd George or Clemenceau, issues what he calls the 14 points. And he issues this in January of 1918. Okay, so the Americans enter in 1917. 
They begin to fight. The Germans realize that they're going to lose now because they've got fresh troops that they've got to fight. But this new American president, well, he's not new, but the new to the war president, releases this document, which calls for open covenants, okay? What Wilson is really talking about is what we need are peace treaties that are completely transparent, where everyone can see exactly what the agreement to end the war is going to be. Now, for those of you who read the 14 points, uh, you probably thought they were pretty boring. They are. Okay, points one, two, and three, pretty straightforward, typical rules of engagement as far as world politics is concerned. Four, a new innovation, reducing national armaments, but, you know, people had said that before. No one was going to take it really seriously. Five gets really weird. A free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. This is heresy. This is a total revolution in world politics. World politics, which had heretofore been dominated by the idea of empire, where the right of conquest was solemnly enshrined, where people could take over and rule other people ruthlessly without any regard for the well-being of the people who were being ruled. This had been the rule since the days of the Egyptians. And now, here was this American president introducing this incendiary new doctrine that comes to be known as self-determination. Okay. Big, big, big news. Now, in reality, this doesn't bother the Germans all that much because one of the gripes of the Germans is that because they were late to the colonial game, they hadn't gotten very many good colonies. The British, the French, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they had gotten all the good places. And what did the Germans get? They got Papua New Guinea. You know, big deal. That doesn't make, that doesn't make us wealthy, but doesn't make us rich. <coughs> so the Germans don't really care about this. But the French and the British, they look at this and they say, Wilson is bonkers. Wilson is completely stupid. Wilson doesn't understand what world politics is all about. So then you go through the other 14 points, and they all have to do with implementing the idea of self-determination in the empires that are going to be crumbling after World War I. And those, the two most important empires that are going to crumble are the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. You know, these are the ones that are going to go, and this is what Wilson is worried about. And Wilson wants to make sure that when these two empires crumble, the principle of self-determination will determine the future shape of the politics of these former uh, uh, conquered peoples. It was a vain, vain, vain hope and something really inconsistent with the traditions of American policy. We have photographs of Wilson 
sitting down, or actually kneeling on the floor, with these huge maps of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And these maps are filled with the ethnic groups that live in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And what he's trying to do, he's trying to draw boundaries that make the nations equal to the states. We have the fiction of the nation state, but we know it's a fiction because most states have many nations. What Wilson really wanted to do was to try to make sure that every nation had its own state. Now he did this because he thought that this would solve the problem of war because he was a Kantian. He really thought that if people could govern themselves and had the ability to vote on their interests, they would vote for peace. And we've gone through this argument about the democratic peace before. But the truth of the matter is, is that this is, and uh, here, what I'm gonna show you is, how the uh, principle of self-determination breaks down in the former uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. It doesn't break down very nicely. Um, in point of fact, it breaks down in a very crippling way that pretty much sets up World War II. Um, Wilson is trying to do is he's trying to make sure that all these different ethnic groups have their own states. But look at the way they're divided. The pink are the German-speaking people. They ultimately become the roots of World War II. Hitler makes a self-determination claim in, at the beginning of World War II. His argument is, that all German-speaking peoples should be ruled by a German state. And thus, when he takes over parts of Austria and parts of Czechoslovakia in those pink places that are German-speaking, he claims that what he's trying to do is realize the aspiration of the German-speaking people and he's consolidating them into a single state. The same is true, ultimately, when you create Hungary, or when you create Romania, or when you create Bulgaria, or when you create Yugoslavia, and you try to mush all these different people together, pretending that a single state can represent all these nations. And ultimately, all this stuff falls apart. And it is in the fantasies of Wilson in 1918 that you sow the seed of this potential disaster. Now, the hard thing is, is that we all believe in self-determination. We truly believe that self-determination is the right way to go that people should be free to choose their own government. This is a, you know, a cardinal rule for most of us. But the truth of the matter is, is that people aren't spread around that way. That if what you want to do is to define the nation ethnically or racially, you're gonna have all sorts of trouble you're gonna have real troubles. If you look, for example, 
at the Kurds, the largest nation without a state. That's where the Kurds live, okay? But you have to cut the Kurdistan out of four states. You've got to cut the Kurds out of Syria, out of Iraq, out of Iran, out of Turkey. Do we know of many states that are willingly giving up their territory in order to satisfy national aspirations? No, it doesn't happen. And then when, you, when it gets really, really complicated, if you look at the ethnic groups in the, the breakdown of the former Ottoman Empire, you know, get out of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, look at this melange of colors, all these different ethnic groups. How are you organized, going to organize states to map over these nations? Particularly if you believe that having states with contiguous territory is the only way to have viable states. It's virtually impossible. Now, the correct thing for an American president would have been to say, well, the basis of the nation is not ethnicity. The basis of the nation is not race. The basis of the nation is not religion. The basis of the nation is agreement upon rules. And what we want to do is we want to create states where people can agree upon the rules. Think how e much easier it would be if we could organize the world into states where one state was ruled by people who liked to watch romantic dramas and another state was ruled by people who liked to watch science fiction and another people, uh, state was ruled by people who wanted to watch crime dramas, or fantasies, or whatever. Think how easy it would be to rule the world under those circumstances. But does that make sense? No. So what are you going to do? You got a real serious problem. Well. Wilson doesn't resolve this, but he is shuttled off into the dustbin of history because Clemenceau and Lloyd George both make the decision that the thing Wilson cares about most is not the idea of self-determination. The thing that Wilson cares about the most is the League of Nations. And so Will, uh, Clemenceau and Lloyd George say to Woodrow Wilson, OK, Woody, fine. We'll give you the League of Nations. Let us take care of everything else. The problem is, is that the Germans had read the 14 points. And they were impressed by the 14 points. Open covenants, openly arrived at. And the Germans say to themselves, wow, the 14 points. We can live with the 14 points. This is a piece of cake. There's nothing in the 14 points that really harms German interest. And we know we're going to lose the war because the Americans just came in. So let's sue for an armistice, a cessation of hostilities based upon the 14 points. And then we'll sign a peace treaty based upon the 14 points. So on November 11th, the 11th day of the 11th month at 11 o'clock in the morning, 11, 11, 11, the Germans sign the armistice, at which point they're confronted with the Treaty of Versailles, which Clemenceau and Lloyd George had put together without consulting Wilson. So the Germans signed the Armistice Treaty based upon the 14 points, and then they see the peace treaty, which is the most punitive peace treaty 
in the history of world politics. The Germans have got to give up all their colonies. They've got to give up all their, a lot of their territory. They've got to pay huge reparations. They've got to assume war guilt. They have to do all these things. And the Germans freak out. They say, what the hell is going on? Wilson says this. Lloyd George and Clemenceau says this. We've been screwed. And Lloyd George and Clemenceau say, yeah, you have. You want to start fighting again? <laughs> and obviously, that's a no-go for the Germans. They know they're going to win. They're going to lose. So they can't start fighting again. And they swallow the Treaty of Versailles, which sets the world up for the second phase of the Great European War. Wilson tries to get the League of Nations through. France and Britain actually join the League of Nations. The Americans do not. They don't because of the activities of Henry Cabot Lodge. And you read his speech to the Senate. And I hope you enjoyed his speech to the Senate. The language of his uh, speech is typical of the age. It is it's just redolent with the idea of American exceptionalism. And it reeks of the racism that was becoming entrenched in the way the world was thinking about the world due to the science of race, which is one of the more abysmal phases of human history, where you had anthropologists all saying that we have scientific evidence that approves that some races are superior to others, or some races are inferior to others. And Wilson was a child of that age. Uh, and it was, without a doubt, one of the worst episodes in American history, in US, in world history. And it sets the Germans up for their own escapade into entrenched racism. 